we saw in our lectures on hermeneutics that the infinite character of interpretation and context means that you can never be sure that you have reached the right interpretation of whatever it is that you are interpreting. But in this lecture, we will see that some thinkers want to go much further. They want to claim that you can never reach the right interpretation at all. That maybe there is no right interpretation in the first place. And that even the original author did not fully understand what he or she was saying or doing. These claims are often associated with postmodernism because they suggest that there could be multiple competing interpretations, all of which are equally good. And perhaps the most famous philosopher to defend them is the French thinker Jacques Derrida. When Derrida looks at the way that the Western tradition has understood language, he finds that the concepts of presence and absence have played an important role. What has fascinated many thinkers about language is that you can use it to talk about things that are absent, that are not here, that are not around you. Without using language, you could pick up a stone and show it to someone and you'll both in a sense be thinking about that particular same stone. But with language, you can also communicate about things that are not there. I can talk to you about elephants, even though I don't have an elephant here and you probably don't have an elephant over there either. Now, how does language achieve this feat of allowing us to communicate about absent things? The traditional answer Derrida tells us is that language makes these absent things present. Not literally, of course. If I talk about elephants, they don't suddenly appear around me. But what does become present is the concept of elephant, which becomes present in your mind. If you understand English, then just by saying elephant, I can make the concept of elephant appear in your mind. Maybe not as a picture before your mind's eye, but something a bit like that anyway. Now, Derrida believes that this traditional idea of language is completely wrong. And he bases that assessment on the theories of de Saussure. Remember that Saussure told us that the meaning of a concept is determined not by an example of something to which the concept applies, but by its relations to lots and lots of other concepts in the language. I want to give another illustration of that in order to make sure that we understand it. And rather than taking a word, this time I'm going to take a cultural phenomenon, namely the phenomenon of owning a Ford Focus car. So, suppose that my neighbor has bought a Ford Focus. That tells you something about him. But what? Well, in order to understand the cultural meaning of a Ford Focus, it is little help to just be shown a Ford Focus. If I take you outside, show you the car and say, well, that's what it means to own one of these, you are no closer to understanding my neighbor. Rather, what I need to do is to explain the differences between owning a Ford Focus and owning another kind of car. I have to explain that it's more of a sign of affluence than owning a Daihatsu Quora would be, but much less exorbitant than owning a Ferrari sports car would be. That it's not as much as a hobby car as an old Citroën de chevaux would be, and so on. Only by knowing about the relations between this type of car and all other types of car would you get to know about the cultural meaning of the Ford Focus. In fact, you would need to know more. You would need to know about the cultural difference between owning a car and owning another kind of vehicle, like a motorbike 
a racing bike, a truck, a private jet, and so on. And you would also need to know about the difference between spending all your money on a car and spending it on something else, like a pool, plastic surgery, expensive vacations, charity, etc. Knowing what the ownership of this car tells you about my neighbor involves knowing a huge amount of differences between this situation and all these other possible situations that my neighbor could also have been in. So this extended example should give us a feeling for the sheer size of the structure that determines the meaning of even a relatively simple thing, like owning a particular brand and type of car. Now Derrida concludes from such examples and other considerations that the traditional theory of language cannot be right. That it can't be true that hearing a word makes the concept belonging to that word present in your mind. If you think about concepts as pictures, that might seem possible. I say Ford Focus, and you get a picture of a Ford Focus in your mind, making it present before your mind's eye. But once you have understood that the meaning of concept is not determined by such an example, but by their place in a structure, this stops making sense. For can we really believe that when I say Ford Focus, you get in your mind this whole structure, all these types of cars, vehicles, things you could spend your money on and so forth, all of it present at once in your consciousness? Of course not. The structure that determines the meaning of any concept is far too big to ever think of at one instant. You just can't have it clearly in mind. You cannot have the full meaning of any concept present to your consciousness. We have seen that thinkers like Nietzsche, de Saussure and Rorty believe that the world does not have a language-like structure, but that language projects structure into the world. Derrida completely agrees with that. This means that meanings, concepts, don't exist in the objects. A tree does not in any way carry with it the meaning tree. It could be described using infinitely many concepts in infinitely many totally different languages. But what Derrida adds to this is that meanings also don't exist in our minds. When I think about trees, I don't have the meaning of tree in my consciousness. All I have is some knowledge, partly conscious, partly unconscious, and never complete about the relations between the concept of tree and other concepts in my language. Meanings are not in the things, they are, well, they are nowhere really, because concepts consist of references to other concepts, which in turn consist of references to yet other concepts, and so on. Language is a bit like a dictionary. Any word is defined in terms of other words, which themselves are again defined in terms of words. Determining the full meaning of something would involve tracing all these relations until you have mapped them all. But of course, our conceptual worlds are far too big and rich for that, and they are also constantly changing. We can never determine the full meaning of anything, because we can never grasp our entire language in one single thought. Perhaps the most quoted sentence from Derrida's books is Il n'y a pas de hors texte, often translated as there is nothing outside of the text. Some commentators, especially in the English-speaking world, believe that with this sentence Derrida claims that there are no things, that there is only language. But in fact what he claims is that when you are trying to determine the meaning of something, you are always following relations from one item of language to another, because meaning is those relations. You always remain within the structure of language, and you can never escape from having to do even more interpretation 
by finding a perfectly clear meaning either in a thing or in someone's mind. But that means, Derrida points out, that traditional hermeneutics was based on a fiction. For traditional hermeneutics wants to interpret a text so well that it rediscovers the original intention of the author. Now that makes sense only if the original intention of the author was clear, if the author really knew perfectly well what she was saying. But her original intention can't have been clear. Nobody ever knows with perfect clarity what they are saying, because nobody can have the full structure of their language fully in mind. When I say something, or write something, or even just think something, I am using a language that I can never fully understand. And so I never fully understand what I am saying or thinking. My own thoughts and writings are even for myself things that have to be interpreted. What does that mean for interpretation? Well, Derrida would say that a postmodern hermeneuticist has to drop the idea that there is a perfectly clear original meaning which we want to recover. By relating a text to different parts of the context, we can generate good and interesting interpretations. Often very different interpretations if we focus on different parts of the context. But this process of interpretation is endless and can never end with a clear and determinate answer. There are better and worse interpretations, but there is no right interpretation, because there never was a clear meaning to begin with. Thus, interpret as we may, we will never get to perfect clarity. Language just doesn't work like that.